This is Viewpoint. And welcome into Viewpoint this morning. I'm Joe Paris. In a few weeks on Tuesday, November 8th, voters across Idaho, they'll head to the polls for the general election, decide on who they want to represent them in key federal and state offices. And this week, we're focused on the race to represent Idaho in the United States Senate. Previously here on Viewpoint, we hosted incumbent Republican Mike Crapo, and we also chatted with Crapo's opponent, Democrat candidate David Roth. And we spoke about why each candidate is running for U.S. Senate, their views on major American issues like the economy and inflation, and the impact that it has on Idahoans. We also touched on major social debates like abortion and changing laws here in Idaho and the interaction with all of that with the federal government. You can watch those interviews with Crapo and Roth right now on KTVB.com. And to round off the race for the United States Senate today, I am joined by independent candidate Scott Cleveland. Cleveland writes on his website that he was born and raised in New Mexico and was taught the value of hard work by both of his parents and started working part-time at a young age. Cleveland has worked in business and finance for years and in 2014 he established a boutique investment and brokerage firm in Eagle Idaho. Cleveland writes that he is a lifelong Republican until 2020. He's decided to run as an independent conservative candidate and Cleveland says that he remains conservative and strongly believes in the America First movement. He says that the old guard, the rhino-led Republican Party he once knew, no longer aligns with his America First principles. And Mr. Cleveland joining us here this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's been a long uh, campaign trail, I guess yes. inside a month now. How are things going for you so far? It's going great, Joe. It's been a lot of work. It's been fun. Uh, I entered the race November 7th uh, of last year, so we're, we're coming up on the one-year mark of campaigning, and actually it's gone by pretty fast. As you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts, but we've enjoyed the journey so far. And uh, about three weeks out, here we go. It's, it's game on for sure. So thanks for having me on the show. So I, a big question, and I imagine you, you get to the crux of this when you talk to people out in the communities around yeah. the state. Why are you riding, running for United States Senate? It's a right. big role. Right. Well, thank you. And thanks for the question. Well, uh, Joe, I'm just a regular guy. I'm a business owner. I'm a husband. Uh, I started a political action group a couple of years ago. And my candidacy for this office was kind of born out of that, uh, that group. And, you know, I, I just look at the job that our leaders are doing. The people in Washington, D.C., on both sides of the political aisle, in my opinion, are failing miserably at serving the best interest of everyday average Idahoan citizens. And I'm resolved to do something about that. That is my agenda here. Uh, I'm not looking to, uh, you know, make myself famous. Uh, I don't necessarily need the benefits or the perks that goes along with a career in Washington, D.C., uh, my heart's in the right place. I'm willing to go serve the citizens because they're not being well represented right now, and that's not right. So if elected, how would you view your role of being a United States senator representing the state of Idaho? Of okay. course, in the West, of course, the gem state, we have unique uh, issues sure. and unique priorities. Sure. Well, I grew up in the West, so I'm familiar with the issues out here, land issues, water issues, uh, quality of life, the recreational opportunities. We have a lot of problems in this country, and some are specific to Idaho, but most are general in nature. The good news, Joe, though, is I believe that many of these problems are self-inflicted and reversible. Now, none of them are going to be quick fixes, but I'm willing to go do my part in Washington, D.C., and that's why I'm running as an independent conservative. We say that all in one breath, by the way, because if you're not a conservative in Idaho, you are very unlikely to win a statewide race. I did a lot of research uh, before diving into this race. So as an independent conservative, I guess, mm -hmm. how do you view your role within, I guess, the, the larger conservative movement here right. in Idaho? Do you align with Republican GOP Idaho values, or do you kind of have a little bit of a different take? I have a little bit of a take, a different take. I'm a liberty candidate. I'm a freedom candidate. I'm a uh, constitutional person. And many of our uh, good old boy rhino networks, I don't call them rhinos anymore, Joe. I've come up with a new term. I call them blue Republicans. Mm. They don't serve the interest of true, of true conservatives anymore. And uh, this battle is being played out not only in the state of Idaho, but nationally, of course, where you have this, this poll from the Mitch McConnell's, Kevin McCarthy's of the world versus, uh, say, the Freedom Caucus. And on a smaller scale, that's happening here in Idaho as well. Would you view yourself as, as an outsider? I guess, how would you frame this conversation? Because I know, you know, in recent right. years, even with President Donald Trump, right. the idea of being an outsider or not part of the old guys right. club has right. been very successful with some voters. Where do you see yourself right. in that conversation? Well, I'm definitely an outsider. I went, I went from, it's changed over the last 10 months. I went from long shot candidate <laughs> to, uh, uh, to uh, contender <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in there. And I don't mind wearing the outsider moniker. Uh, as you know, I've never held public office before. And when I've traveled the state for the last 10 months, 
a lot of people that have uh, introduced themselves to me, they say, oh, you've never held office? Great, that's good enough for me. <laughs> because they don't have a lot of confidence uh, with elected officials at this point in time. They look around at what's going on in their lives and they say, how, how are we here? How did we get here? Uh, we have to do better than what we are, are doing and how do we go about that? Well, maybe some new leadership is step one in that direction. Well, let's get into uh, some of the big topics here. Sure. Really, right on that note, you wrote on your website about Mike Crapo and uh, your view sure. of his federal spending, and on yes. your website you called it reckless spending. Um, what would you diff do differently in terms of voting for spending packages and these huge trillion dollar things right. we see in Congress? Right. Well, our leaders, both Republicans and Democrats, are fiscally irresponsible. And Mike Crapo, I have nothing personal against Senator Crapo. He's a good man. But he's a part of that reckless spending. Uh, as much as he likes to try to distance himself from that, he's not apart from it. When Senator Crapo took office uh, many years ago, our debt was $4 trillion, with a T, a mere $4 trillion. Uh, this past week, it clicked over $31 trillion in the middle of the night, and that is not sustainable. Uh, that is reckless spending, and he is a part of it because he did vote last summer for the $1.25 trillion uh, so-called infrastructure bill. Uh, that, that is just one example of where his voting record doesn't match up with, with true conservative values. He voted uh, for the infrastructure bill. Uh, he voted against the CHIP bill that would have benefited a, a local employer, Micron, our, one of our largest local uh, employers. He voted against that. Uh, about eight weeks ago, he voted against a uh, package for the United States military veterans. So his track record, he's gone off the rails on his voting track record. As far as the spending in general goes, we have got to get our, our financial house in order. And we're not going to do that by printing money out of thin air. In the last five, six years, they have printed $7 trillion with a T. Do you know how many zeros are in a trillion? That's like eight or nine. It's 12, Joe. Okay. 12. That's a lot of zeros. And we can't keep doing that. Those zeros, that reckless spending, is why we're being uh, subject to this crushing inflation. Everyone has their political issues. They might have them in slightly different order, as do I. But the number one issue when, when Americans are polled today is this crushing inflation, the cost of gasoline. Uh, that is crushing the middle class across this country. It's not right. And I'm not convinced that the political elite in Washington, these people are all wealthy, I'm not sure that they're very concerned about that, to be honest. They, they provide lip service to the issue instead of trying to tackle the issue. So when we talk about inflation, you know, and coming from a financial and a business uh, standpoint, what would you do in Congress differently to approach the idea of inflation? Would it be something right. as simple as, hey, I just am not going to vote to support any of these major packages? Or do, what beyond that do you think it looks like? Well, you, you do have to realize that as a sitting United States senator, your power, your, your main power, if you will, is the power of the purse. The framing fathers of this country uh, broke up the three branches and the legislative branch was given the power of the purse. And you have to use that. You do have to say no to reckless spending. I'd like to see where, uh, instead of them putting all this sausage into one giant bill, good and bad, and uh, being asked to vote on it in the next 24 hours when most of the legislation hasn't even been read yet, I I'd like to see a competing bill, a stripped down standalone bill for the good that would serve the country. We do need to spend money. Uh, uh, the Florida hurricane relief would be a good example of that. That, no, that money needs to go to Florida to help out. But what does that have to do with spending $12 billion to the Ukrainians? Nothing, Joe, we, we all know that. So I've been asked about that many times, and I think we need to get back to a package where you, you have competing bills, stripped down versions, standalone versions, and force the legislative body to stand on their record by which one they supported, with pork or without? I'll go without. Because in, in the state of Idaho, you have the state legislature, you have a, you have a law that says, you know, it's basically one topic per bill. Sure. And sure. Representative sure. Russ Fulcher up in Congress, he supported that on a national level. Right. It sounds like you would kind of support the idea, one sure. bill, one topic. Sure. There's nothing stopping a United States senator from promoting his own legislation, standalone legislation. They all act like their hands are tied, uh, which is just not true. Now, maybe it doesn't get the support from Chuck Schumer, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. What do you think it would be like breaking into, you know, Congress, as you, as you highlight? I mean, right. there's a lot of very wealthy, very well-established sure. politicians, as we talked about. Sure. You're new to the political game. Right. How do you see that playing out? Well, uh, I've been to Washington, D.C. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice place surrounded by bureaucrats. There's giant buildings all, all across the countryside there. 
and they all have a job to do, and, and so do I, though. But sitting as a, as a, whether you're a new senator or a 40-year incumbent like my opponent, Mike Crapo, your vote is the same. There's 100 people that, that vote on legislation and, and create legislation. So I'll have the same amount of power as anybody else. And I'm not interested in joining any unique club. I don't care about their cocktail parties, their Christmas parties, and hanging out with these people, Joe. I'm there to do a job for the citizens of Idaho, and by extension, the American people. And I don't really care about their cool kids club. And one of the topics I read about uh, when researching your, your candidacy is uh, is about term limits. It, yes. it sounds like you know you, you have a significant bone to pick in terms of term right. limits and people you know serving in Washington for decades. Right. What idea do you have specifically on term limits? Well, I'd like to see term limits. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but term limits were originally in the Articles of Federation many many years ago before our United States Constitution was ratified. And when they did finally ratify the U.S. Constitution we have today, they took term limits for members of Congress out. They didn't want to vote themselves out of a job. Now here we are, 240 some years later, my opinion, we're paying the price for this. I don't think the original intent was for people to go to Washington and make a career out of it, 20, 30, 40 years. And the longer someone is there, the more they're beholden to lobbyists and special interest groups and not the people. And you can look at, at how they're funded. Uh, again, I'm not trying to bag on Senator Crapo, but his, his finances are a matter of public record. 98% of his funding comes from outside of Idaho. Pfizer, Facebook, Bill Gates, you go right down the list. Is that really what is uh, going to uh, serve the best interest of the people? I can tell you where my donors come from. It's Joe P. Lunchbucket and, and John Q. Retiree. Uh, that's what our framers had in mind. Go do your job for a term or two and then go home. Joe, I'm already 61 years old. I'm not looking for a 30-year career in Washington. I'd love to serve the people for the right reasons for a term or two and then call it a day and go get on with my life. We need more of that. And hey, we're on Viewpoint this morning with Scott Cleveland running for United States Senate. We're going to take a real quick break, but when we come back, we're going to get more into the federal inflation plus major social issues that Idahoans and Americans are talking about. Viewpoint continues right after this. And welcome back to Viewpoint. This morning we are talking the race for the United States Senate. And joining us this morning, candidate, independent conservative, Scott Cleveland. Yes. And uh, Mr. Cleveland, before we went to break, we were talking about the economy, a little bit of inflation. I want to go back to that arena. Uh, there's been a lot of talk heading into the election about the IRS and the Biden administration basically dedicating $80 billion to the IRS. Now, yes. the Biden administration is talking about updating technology, making sure staffing's up to shore, trying to get rid of some of the document backlog. Critics, though, of the IRS say that overfunding it is going to punish Americans in the sense that they'll start auditing mm -hmm. uh, non-wealthy Americans, start going after bizarre things, trying to mm -hmm. handicap Americans. The IRS and the inflation and all this is really tied in together. And you coming from a business background, I'm curious, sure. what are your thoughts on the current funding of the IRS and do you see problems with it? Well, the IRS is a bureaucracy like anything else that we deal with these days. And they could use a few more employees. And I, I don't mind sharing that, but I'm not sure they need $80 billion worth of new employees. Uh, if you call the IRS right now, the hotline, a good friend of mine, my treasurer is a CPA. You mentioned your father is a CPA by trade. You will be on hold for an eternity waiting to have someone answer your question at the IRS. So they could use a little bit of help. $80 billion, though, not a chance. Uh, maybe what we do is we spend $5 billion to, to get some, some more uh, help desk folks at the IRS and spend the other $75 billion on border patrol, border security. Maybe that would have been a better use of the taxpayers' funds. I'm just saying. Uh, let's move on to uh, a major topic, and I know something you're passionate about, election integrity, and this came sure. up in the Idaho public television debate. Right. Um, looking forward, we could talk about 2020, we could talk about the past, but looking right. forward, sure. what are your thoughts on election integrity? Do you have trust in American elections? Uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done to in improve the trust level of the American people. Uh, it goes all the way, and you heard me say it, it goes from the voter rolls being cleaned up a little bit, uh, using uh, ID across the land to vote. I'd like to see a national holiday for federal elections. I think we could all take off, you know, one day of the year and go do something as uh, important as electing our representatives and so on. So election integrity is a hot button issue. 
uh, about half of the country, some, somewhere along that lines, do not believe that Joe Biden was legitimately elected as a U.S. president. There's no question he is the president, okay, but how did he get there? Um, and I think that if we're going to improve those things, that uh, looking at some of the machines and how the machines work, I, I think there's a lot that could be done to shore things up, and that would uh, maybe uh, instill better confidence out of the average voter. That's what I'm hoping for. Everybody just wants free and fair elections. I don't mind losing an election as long as it was conducted fairly. And when it's not conducted fairly, uh, your vote is being taken away by someone else, and I don't think that's right. That's not the American way. And we're, I guess, way well more than two years away from, you know, from the election, uh, for the, pri the previous election, I should say, right. and as you highlighted. Right. There's a significant portion of Americans that, for whatever reason, they, they don't trust in the American election sure. system. Sure. At this point, you know, without being able to go back and address things from the past, right. what would you do going forward to create that trust? Because if elected at the federal level, I imagine you would want your constituents to have full faith in you. Well, I think we need to get away from this early voting, mail-in voting, ballot boxes in the middle of the night. I've seen some of the footage of uh, you know, places in, in the country where people were dropping off clearly multiple ballots in the dead of night into some of these drop boxes. Some of those reforms are very doable. Again, states are to be, or uh, excuse me, elections are to be c conducted on a state level. It's a state's rights issue. Uh, but I think all states could do a better job of it, including Idaho. So do you think the solution there would kind of be what you touched on is a federal holiday, you know, the first Tuesday in November is to say everyone has the day off, you know, yeah. there'd be no need for early voting because everyone goes and votes on that day? Right. Well, that, now, there are legitimate reasons for somebody not to be able to go to the polls on a specific date. Uh, an example would be somebody working overseas, the military, a U.S. Embassy, something like that. And also there are people with legitimate, uh, you know, disabilities in nature and they can't get out necessarily quickly and easily, but those should be very limited exceptions. The bulk of the American electorate could find a way to get to the polls on November 8th, and I think we should go back towards that. Uh, let's uh, talk to you on a, another specific topic to you, your path to victory. You find yourself in, in a right. very unique situation here, as you touched on. Idaho, a heavily Republican state. Yes. And I've seen questions, you know, uh, maybe some of your supporters saying, you know, will Mr. Cleveland split the Republican vote? Yes, yes. What are your thoughts on your path to victory? Because it is unique. Okay, well, here's the thing. So if you looked at the primary this year, 33% of the registered Republicans in this state rejected Senator Mike Crapo as their candidate of choice. Now, the sad news is that was split between four different people, but it still adds up to 33%. So uh, I can win the race, and I'm planning on winning the race with as little as 34% of the statewide total. And how does that look? Well, if I can get my message out to those same conservative voters that rejected Crapo, I'm not starting with zero, Joe. I don't know exactly what the number is, but assuming that group comes over, uh, the final victory looks like this. Cleveland 34, Crapo 33, Democrat David Roth, Roth, I think he pronounced Roth. Roth, he does pronounce it Roth, uh, 32 maximum. Uh, in a statewide three-way race in Idaho, a Democrat in the last 30 years has never topped 32%. And this, in this candidate race, I don't see David getting above 30, 32. But I'll give him that, he will get that. But no matter how, how you divide the remaining amount, it's either going to be Crapo or myself. It is not going to be a Democrat in the United States Senate seat representing Idaho. Not in this cycle, not, not anytime soon. So my path to victory is Cleveland 34, Crapo 33, Roe 32, and that leaves 1% for your fringe candidates. And, it, you know, conversely, if not elected, I guess, what would you do from there? Would you want to remain and, you know, active in this type of work? You seem very passionate about well, sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. I still have a business, my financial planning business. I'm committed to my clients, and I will continue to do that. But I'll also continue my political activities as well, because the quest for li uh, liberty and freedom never stops, Joe. I know that sounds cliche, uh, but we have a lot of work to do to save this country from the direction that it's headed. And I know you've, you've mentioned in, in some of your political advertising and here on this program, Mr. Crapo has been in office, you know, for, for a number of years now. So yes. Idahoans have had the opportunity to get to know him. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit off the politics sphere. Sure. Who, who is Scott Cleveland? Who are you? Where do you come from? How do you find yourself here? Well, uh, you know, I'm a married guy. I've been married uh, faithfully to my wife, Kathy, for 33 years. We're blessed. We're Christians. We have a great life. Uh, we don't have any children of our own, uh, but we make pretty good aunts and uncles. Uh, we've traveled pretty uh, extensively. Uh, I've worked pretty hard. I spent 23 years wearing a suit and tie in corporate America for a Fortune 100 company. Uh, I like to fish. 
Uh, you can find me out on the Boise River behind the house there fly fishing sometimes. I'm a race fan. Uh, I'm also a fan of the Second Amendment. I like to go shoot at the range once in a while. And I just, uh, I enjoy cooking. I, I cook on the back, uh, backyard grill. Kathy does the cleaning. I do the cooking most of the time. But I have a well-balanced uh, life. I'm blessed in many, many ways. And I'm always curious, you know, when I meet candidates like yourself that are kind of jumping into a major sure. race, what sure. has this been like, jumping into the United States Senate race against, you know, somebody like Mike Crapo? Sure, sure. Well, there's been a lot of new learning involved, but I'm not going to Mars. Other people have uh, successfully <laughs> run uh, political campaigns, and there are independents in the United States Senate. There's uh, no less than three independents in, the, uh, in Congress, excuse me, not in the Senate itself. Uh, there are over 120 independents in state houses and, and uh, state governments throughout the uh, country. Uh, so what I did is a lot of research, you know, being a financial advisor, you're used to researching a lot. Uh, I looked at uh, how to go about this, and I definitely uh, realized that you're not going to uh, get where you need to go. You must be on the ballot November 8th when it counts. Had I run, re-registered and run as a Republican, that would have been a losing effort. So I avo avoided that. Uh, it's been interesting. You have lots of people uh, that want to help. Uh, we're blessed. Uh, what's happened for Kathy and I, myself is every time we needed a, a specific uh, expertise, if you will, God put that person right in front, front of us at the right time and they joined our team. And, and that continues to happen. Uh, so it's been an amazing journey. It is exhausting. It's all-consuming. I'm not complaining. I signed up with it for it. We've met some great people. We've been to Coeur d'Alene five times, Eastern Idaho four times, and we have a couple more trips lined up. And we've met some really, really great people. And what I love about Idahoans, yes, I'm not a native son. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, you, you know, they don't hold back. They don't mince words. They come up and say what's on their mind, whether you agree or disagree, whether as long as it's respectful. Uh, I love to hear from other people. So it's been a listening tour as much as a speaking tour. Real quickly, before we wrap up uh, the show, I want to sure. know what topic or what area would be kind of your, your signature area or your signature, I guess, interest of, of pursuing? Right. Well, uh, I think we need to get our financial house in order. So anything to do with the budget or money, I, I would want to be involved in things like that. I do, I do think we also have a very pressing issue at the southern border. We are being invaded in this country. Over 200,000 people a month are coming across our U.S. border. That is a national security threat, and that has to be dealt with in short order. We're going to have bigger problems down the road. Well, this is Viewpoint here on your Sunday morning. We're wrapping up our coverage of the United States Senate race. And joining us here this morning, Mr. Scott Cleveland. Mr. Cleveland, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to following the race in uh, less than a month till Election Day. Very good. Thank you, Joe, for having me on. All right. We're going to step aside. But when we come back, we will put this show to bed. This is Viewpoint. Returns right after this. And thank you so much for joining us here on your Sunday morning on Viewpoint. Again, thank you to Mr. Scott Cleveland for joining us here this morning. Of course, if you missed any of our coverage of the United States Senate race or anything else from our Viewpoint coverage, you can check it out anytime on KTVB.com or the KTVB YouTube channel. And as we get closer and closer to the election, you want to check out KTVB.com and our voter guide. Inside of our voter guide, our staff has put together all the races statewide from the federal level all the way down to your local county level. Inside that, you can learn more about the candidates and the issues that they are passionate about. Also inside the KTVB Voter Guide, you can take a look at registration information and Election Day information. Of course, Election Day is November 8th, coming up in less than a month. And if you need anything, again, you can check out our website, ktvb.com. Again, for Viewpoint, I'm Joe Paris. Thank you for joining us this morning. We'll be back next Sunday morning on our road to the election here in Idaho.